Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we are so lucky to be joined by the award-winning audiobook narrator, voice actor and beloved coach, Johnny Heller. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. How are you today? I'm, I'm great. It's a beautiful day in New York City. Uh, things I've got plenty of work in front of me, so can't ask for anything more. Nice one. Uh, as is uh, tradition on this show, I'd love to start um, right at the beginning. Would you be able to perhaps tell us about your background, how you came into the world of audiobook narration? Okay, um, I, I was, I'm from Chicago, um, and I had done you know, theater, and um, I, was in, in, I was a newspaper, a journalist, a newspaper reporter after college. Um, I used to, I write a, I wrote a humor column called For the Hell of It, which still exists, just it's different topics now. Um, and then I got hired by um, Chicago Sun-Times, and I worked for them, and I left that world of, that's the only job I've ever really, 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 really liked. But I left it to go become this world-famous actor, which meant <laughs> 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 we did get no job as waiters and bartenders and years of study. Um, and while I studied with my acting guru, a guy named Ted Liss, who was a legend, um, he did a lot. He was one of these really, in, 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 he had the voice of God that did all those, you know, hello, buy this crap, you know. So, um, yeah. um, um, and I and I sound like this. And some agents came to see us do some uh, some Shakespeare stuff, and they said, "Who's that guy?" And they liked that. The, I think cause I have a quir- I have a quirky voice. I, mean, I sound like I sound. So, and people, I have the kind of I have the kind of voice that people can impersonate if they want to. Um, so the agents liked it, and so I started doing commercial work. And then, of course, I was in doing stand-up. I was in an improv company. I did stand-up comedy for years. And when I moved to New York, I befriended, or I was befriended by my good friend, Richard Ferrone, hmm. who has that voice of God, too, and he does a lot of these spooky, scary things, really good. And, and, and the way I got into the audiobook business, you can't do anymore. It doesn't exist. Recorded books had studios in the city, and they were actively seeking an adult, for lack, lack of a... It was pretty sophomoric and juvenile. So there I was. So a little hyperactive. So so I came in that like I did all this kid stuff because um, that's that's pretty much that's exactly who I am. Uh, like the Peter Pan syndrome lives in me. Um, so I did all this kid stuff, and then I worked for them, and then eventually I started doing other things. And to be honest with you, I didn't even know how big the industry was or anything about it until I think my very first Audi Award show. Uh, the audio word uh, presentation. I said, "Who are all these people?" I had no idea there were other companies, other people. I didn't even occur to me because it was audiobooks for me. Then was a survival job, like Ten and Bar, right? Um, and I, but I, and now, now I realize it's not my. It's 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 everything I want. Um, I prefer a hell of a lot more money. But it, other than that, in terms of being an actor and answering all, you know, checking off all the boxes, it's what I want. So I got into it basically by an introduction, walking in the door. And luckily, being exactly what they needed when they needed it. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. So it was really sort of kind of being in the right space at the right time. Then there's a, yeah a lot of and and um, having you know having friends. I mean, the idea of karma in this industry mm-hmm. is really important. This is the most um, friendly and mentoring community of human beings I've ever surround. I've ever been near, and mm-hmm. uh, from the very beginning. I mean the big, the, you know, uh, Simon Preble and uh, uh, um, Barbara Rosenblatt and uh, um, oh my, just uh, just all, all the Simon Vance and all these big names and they were they were there and helpful to me in so many ways um, and and it, and and then there's still that that feeling among these people and it's just great so yeah being in the right place at the right time and also not sucking is very important I think. You know, if, if if I wasn't any good, I don't think I would have you know gotten past that interview. Yeah, absolutely. Have you um you mentioned a smattering of other things, other performance related things such as improv comedy, um, and then also journalism as well. Have you always felt a draw to performance and, and storytelling in in the various aspects? Yeah, absolutely, all all my life. I mean, I mean, I'm actually an American history and poli sci major, political oh, okay. science. So um, but I've always been. I always knew I'd be an actor. I'm just. I mean. Is either this or be a missionary, I guess. It was, you know, yeah, there was, there had to be. I, I need, I need, I, I, you know, one of the greatest fears people have is speaking in front of groups, mm-hmm. and I simply don't have that. Okay. I absolutely love it. I come alive there. Yeah. Um, Stand up comedy, so that's why I love that so much. The, um, it's me, my material, and an audience, and I have to win them over and hold them, mm-hmm. and, and there's something very exciting about that. It's not, it's not fear-inducing. It's quite exciting. 
Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, you know, being in theater, all that. I'm I'm first and foremost a trained theater actor, and that's what I think um, is is uh, aids me in my performances because of the training and the fact this is it's very it's very theatrical. Yeah, yeah, I get so. We're comparing then, so from theater and then comedy, especially so re- you know, reliant on that audience participation, you know, that audience feedback, I'd say, um, that you know, if it works immediately, don't you, if they laugh or not? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did you like, I mean, you mentioned not, not sort of fearing public speaking. Is there any, is it that adrenaline, is there any sort of adrenaline rush there? Is there any sort of fear of I need to think on my feet fast in order to make this work? In in live theater, you mean? In, yeah, in, in, in comedy in, or just improv when performing or in front of a stage. Yeah. Oh yeah, there there's the everything you say. Hopefully, in character or a character. Mm-hmm. You, you know, if it's improv, a character you just you know, just created just then, or in your stand up comedy, your my style, everything about it. You have to know if it's working, and you know right away. You can see the you can see the reaction. It's immediate. Mm. One of the bizarre things in the audiobook or commercial voiceover field, which I'm into, um, there is no immediate feedback. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something like I just did, you know, I do a lot of funny books because, you know, it's because. So <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, there's an assumption on my part that there's laughter. Mm-hmm. The difference is if you're in a comedy club and I and I do something or, or, or watching somebody else, you and I will laugh along with everybody else. It's part. Of, it's a group. One guy laughs. Everybody starts laughing. It becomes easier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In an audiobook, it's a much more one-on-one experience. If I make you laugh right now, or you make me laugh right now, it won't be a loud, raucous laugh. Be, <laughs> you know, and then we carry on. So the 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 the, the you hold for a much longer laugh because you can see the people laughing in stand up. Mm-hmm. In an audiobook, you I can't I can't say something funny and then say and then <laughs> wait that long for assumed laughter. What if they didn't find it funny? Yeah. So you, there has to be a um, there's there's a little bit of um, uh, intuitiveness there. I think you've got you've got, you've got to play it right, and it's because you're playing to one person in an audio book, a, 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 you know, a group of one. Yeah. And it changes it changes everything about what you do and how you do it. Yeah, that's interesting. I suppose the pacing as well differs greatly to the type of audio book that it is, and it just goes with that, as you say, the tuition. Um, well, pacing. There, here, here's my take on pacing. Um, <laughs> would you like to uh, Would you like to explain to the listeners what you have? Um, yeah, is, it, yeah, is, it yeah, em- those, is it sewed? Is it like a? It's an it... embroidered thing. Uh, Zura Johnson, a wonderful, wonderful actor, student of mine. Um, it's not a connection that she's a student of mine and a wonderful actor. She happens to be both. That's all. <laughs> but I say to my students, uh, um, I didn't invent the word uh, "fuck," but I, this phrase is I own. Slow the fuck down, which which is very Shakespearean of me. Um, and and what I mean is, people, we all speak much too quickly. I mean, I know. I mean, I, we all mostly because we're we live in dread fear that someone else will get to talk instead of us. So we go and we all speak too quickly, particularly in audiobooks. In general, in stage and everything else, people can pretty much figure out because they can see you. They under, they understand the context of what you say. You know, if you're angry, they know you're angry. They don't have to hear the words. They can see your face. Not so in audiobooks. You need to say the words as written in a way that's. They can, now, I know that listeners can speed it up or slow it down, but our pace has got to be the pace that allows listeners to hear. Mm-hmm. I think there's some reports out that people hear every third word or something. But in audiobooks, we need to be very clear. Not prime of Miss Jean Brody perfect diction necessarily, because everyone doesn't speak that way. They're different characters. But speak clearly and concisely so that people hear what the author wrote, because that's what you got paid to do. Mm-hmm. And we get paid by the finished hour. So going fast is stupid financially. If you do a 10-hour book in eight hours, you just cost yourself two hours of loot, and the listener doesn't know what happened because you went too fast. So it, there has to be that let's slow down a little bit because as soon as we put on our... Here's you and I talking just like this. Like, and we're, we're, sur- we're, you know, we're, we're separated by an ocean, but you and I could be together at a nice pub, <laughs> and we'd be talking just like we're talking right now, shooting the shit, just shooting the breeze. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's time for one of us to act. Well, it's time to. All of a sudden, you get big and loud and fast. I'm like, what? You, what happened? Where did you go? Yeah. And I think we need to get back to who we are, because that's that's who I want. I like John. I want to relate to John York. I I don't want this person John York thinks he needs to be. Yeah. 
So there's the, so that so that's the uh, the background. And I have some other clever sayings also, with colorful blue words in there because <laughs> that tends to get people's attention. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think it's so important as well. I wonder if it's some sort of maybe I'm looking too deep into this. I think maybe it comes from a little bit of nerves as well, sort of like speeding up and getting you know wanting to get your words out there just in case you say something wrong and they might not notice if it's quick enough especially in the <laughs> in conversation world that's how i roll <laughs> um, i was uh, taking a look um through your website and i was just blown away by the amount of awards you've been nominated for and and won um it's incredible um i was wondering how much does the universal recognition um you have um re- uh, you have received play a part when approaching a new title like have you ever found yourself in a position of being overwhelmed with the anticipation of your next release i mean uh, over my personally overwhelmed or other people overwhelmed because of it yourself so i guess like being you know so many people love your work and you're getting recognition for it and you're getting awards for it is there any a time where you know you, you've you've just received another award another earphone award or whatever and you're sitting in a booth on your next title is there any sort of Sometimes oh the no going... no no I I'm I'm never lost in my own bullshit I mean it's nice to have all these uh, you know swell accolades and awards and they're yeah. wonderful paperweights and very lovely and I appreciate them but every 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 new opportunity is a chance to tell a new story um, I I um you 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 simply cannot get <laughs> I'm Johnny Heller I'm gonna <laughs> shut up <laughs> they they want they want it doesn't matter if I'm Johnny Heller or, or I'm John York. They want someone to tell the story. Yeah, they're going to hire the person who can do it. I mean, I, I think what I, I think what I appreciate the most about what I've what I'm known for in my career is um, I don't make many mistakes. Mm-hmm. So the time I spend in the booth is generally time well spent. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell I I'm pretty good at characters. Um, I'm, I do nonfiction. I, I I'm blessed that I do every genre there is pretty much. Mm-hmm. I'm blessed that I get to do all these different genres. Yeah, I'm known for basically a sense of humor and character stuff, but I do everything. And I think one of the things I'm pleased about is everything's, I tell a different story every time because it's a different story. And I certainly don't think even for a second, even for a second about an accolade or an award. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm only aware of me and I'm only aware of the author and what the, and, and the story and the fact that the people in the story don't know the people in the story. That's their world. That's their life. Mm. And and the idea that you know, I don't think any actor, good or bad actor, spends time. Well, as an Academy Award winner, I'd like to say the following: No one says that. It's it sounds it, ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it can work both ways, though, can't it? In a sense of like, sometimes if you've gotten some really positive feedback, if you have like a, you can sort of start getting into that imposter syndrome bit of oh, I'm not as you know, am I gonna you know you know keep that bar at the same level? Am I you know am I <laughs> have I be, am I gonna get caught out in this next one? That kind of thing. I I, I did a, one of my recent blogs um, on the imposter syndrome because. It's it's, I think the syndromes existed for a long time. We've finally given it a name that people can bandy about. Mm-hmm. You know, every new uh, got to be careful here. Every new psychological issue, every new thing, pretty much gets picked up by whoever seems to have it or wants to say they have it. You know, everybody had PTSD, AEH, with all those letters and things. You know, everybody's got <laughs> something. We're, like the, 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 remember the dysfunctional family until we until that word came out. We just thought it was our family, mm-hmm. you know. Where every one of us comes from a dysfunctional family, mm-hmm. if you, it, it just to a degree. In the imposter syndrome thing, I, I never think when I when someone gives me an, an award, when some organization or any, or you get a, you get an accolade for a job well done, I say thanks, I like it, I'm very happy to receive it. But I don't think it changes the job I do. Yeah, and it doesn't change my my perception of myself. I tell everybody, including myself, the sign of, of, a, of a job well done in the audiobook world is another job from the same client. Mm-hmm. So if Penguin Random House hires me consistently, or Oasis Audio, or Blackstone Audio, or Dreamscape Audio, blah, 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 hires me consistently, well, that's a sign that they like what I do. Yeah. Now, if I get an award for it along the way, that's swell. That's very nice. It means those who hand out awards think I should get one. And, and, and reviews and Audible, that's also, everything's swell. But I know for a fact that when somebody says, let's hire Heller, that's the sign that I'm doing a good job because yeah. they're trusting me. And everything else is just nice. Yeah. 
I get that. Where that question came from is because I was actually reading uh, some of the excerpts from from the uh, for the hell of it, um, the essays and observations on your website. Uh, and I must say as well, I I really love your illustrations. Uh, by the way, if you ever uh, want to put one on a T-shirt, I'm your first customer. Um, I the, never thought about it, my Dwight. <laughs> um, but the uh, this may sort of come back to journalism as well. Um, your your time as um, writing. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about your observation of writing and your and your, and your pieces? You have such a, a a clear voice, and I, I wondered, do you think working in the world of storytelling, narrating audiobooks, has changed the way that you think about the world around you? Like perhaps making it second nature to find the story in day to day situations and linking them to bigger themes. I almost think the other way around. Um, okay. I've always been that way. Um, I've always I've always been a. a pretty good with words verbally mm. and 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 in <laughs> except i can't think of the word when you write words <laughs> i'm pretty good at words except for the word i'm trying to find now <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you i'll tell you something that's just this is a here's a tangent i i got covid back um oh my goodness uh, I don't know, some months ago and it was it was you know as bad as it's supposed to be but mm. i have this long-term covid long covid they call it and i tend to um Lose my train of thought or lose a word. I can't find the word. Or I know your name is John York. And I'm like, mm. and all of a sudden your name will pop out of my, my wife's name will pop out of my head. I'm looking right at her. I'm like, and it's devastating. So that happens. So I can't find the word I want. But I guess what I'm trying to say is I've always been fairly articulate both on the page and, and verbally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm used to um, writing is something I quite love. Um, it, it, it comes, uh, um, you know, I, I, I grew up with a British mom, so I, I mean, there, there's an appreciation for the sound of words, mm. um, an appreciation for the, and, and appreciation for, for logic as well. My father's a professor, so all mm. that comes together, but I, I tend to think, I always think in terms of stories and the writing I do in my blog is much like the way I speak normally. Mm. It's just a no pause for interruption for anybody else. It's just, this is a speech I want to give. So I, I try to um, make it um, informative, educational, but funny as well. Because otherwise, what's the, I, if it's not funny, I don't really care as far as I'm concerned in real life. It's got to be, there's too many hard things. That life, you've got to have some fun and, 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 and people like to laugh and that's what I hope I deliver. I, I want that on my gravestone. He made us laugh. Yeah. And not, not, not when he died exactly, but just before. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I always like the idea on a gravestone of having that uh, the phrase, who was the world going to revolve around now? Didn't see that coming. Like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a, a lovely element of comedy running through the posts, um, which really adds to the accessibility of them. Um, and that, that tongue in cheek style is that the same for you? Did that come naturally? Does that finding anecdotes and, and to the bigger subject matter, does that, does that come naturally or is it something you work hard to, to put in after the I, idea? I, I think it, it's always, it's been natural, but then it tends to get honed on your years of doing stand-up comedy and improv and stage work. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm known as a comic actor, you know, mm. I'm, uh, um, yeah, comedy is, is gosh, second nature to me. Mm. Um, I don't know how I, I don't know how I would, I don't think I would have had the success I've had, the career I've had, or the life I've had any step of the way, if I if if not for comedy, um, mm. if not for humor. A sense of humor is essential, and it's. I'll be honest with you. That's all I really care about. Um, there are important things, and we can all wax about them. But yeah, you know, if if, there, if you if you lose humor, you've yeah. lost humanity. Yeah. Oh, that's deep. Right. That put that on the gravestone instead. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree tremendously. I mean, humor's. You know where we turn to, isn't it, in the darkest times, and it can bring us out of the darkest times and get us over such things. Um, it's weird to talk about humor in such a grav in gravelly way, um, but, <laughs> but yeah. Well, it's 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 who people. For example, people are always attracted to humorous people. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not handsome, but I'm funny. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm at best cute, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be the leading man anywhere. I'm I'm the comedy second banana, and I'm fine with that. Funny's funny, and I ever and the things that are funny, if it's really funny, stay funny forever. Mm -hmm. I I know that there are movies you've seen, books you've read that are still funny, no matter how many how many times I don't know what your favorite film is, but I don't know how many times I've seen Blazing Saddles or The Producers mm -hmm. or a, or a, oh my God, so many. Yeah. There, there's three three movie scenes. From from cinema history that always make me laugh, 
always. And when I talk about him, I laugh. When I see him, I laugh, and I can't stop laughing. Yeah. It's just funny. Funny's forever. Yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And you hold it holds a special place in your heart as well, doesn't it? Because it's sort of, I guess, comedy and, and humor. If you go to the cinema, or you know, you you spend a nice evening with your your partner or whatever, or your dog, and you you watch something, and it really lifts you up. It it touches yeah, yeah. you, and you remember that, and it stays with you more than more than most genres, I think. Well, when you're home by yourself, you're gonna watch a movie. Are you gonna watch? Let's be honest. My dinner with Andre, or or you know, or, or Adam Sandler screwing around. Mm. You know, I'm I'm not gonna watch the dinner movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would agree. Me neither. Um, many of our uh, listeners will be aware of you through um, the incredibly loved uh, workshops, uh, the Splendiferous Workshops, <laughs> if I'm saying that right, uh, yes. and, uh, retreats, and, and teaming up with narrators such as uh, Scott Brick and Sean Pratt, to name but a few. Could you tell us how these workshops came about? What made you take an interest in coaching across the world? Uh, and, and what it's like coaching with fellow amazing narrators like Scott and Sean? Well, when I when I started coaching, I'd already done well over 200 books. I know a lot mm-hmm. of uh, narrators have done as many as three books and start coaching, and you know, more power to them. <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I so and people ask me, hey, what can I? How did you get in? How can you can you help me? And I'm like, yeah. So by request, I started doing it. Then I realized there was a a market for it, and the the Splendiferous, my first big workshop, the Johnny Ellis Splendiferous. I want to say 2000, I lose track of dates, 15, 16, I don't remember. The Audio Publishers Association sponsors APAC, the Audio mm-hmm. Publishers Association Convention, at the Javits Center in New York City. Um, and they had done for like, there's that two day event and then the audience is a big week. Mm-hmm. There was a Monday available. Everybody came into town on Sunday. So I booked Baruch College and did this. Well, I booked actually a hotel up by me first and then it got to be too big. So we started an event. I said, I don't want to be just Johnny Heller teaching. Let me get some of the best. Hmm. So I got uh, I got my friend Robert Fass and I got uh, uh, Sean Pratt and I got uh, Scott Brick. And Scott Brick and I have done a lot together. And Sean Pratt and I travel the country and to UK and Canada together. Um, so I because what I think is this, I say things a certain way, uh, and I think we all, Scott and, and Sean and Joanna Perrin and all the wonderful coaches out there, we all make, we all have the same idea for the end result, but the paths to get there are different. And sometimes you need to hear things the way Johnny says it or the way John says it or the way Sean says it or Scott says it to finally sink in. Mm. And other people bring their own personality and styles to the thing. So uh, this group thing became a wonderful kind of a... Um, it was a celebration of the community, really, Yeah. Um, with some of the best coaches, and that carried on. So every year I did it. Now, as since COVID, I wasn't. I did some uh, some online stuff, but now I'm back to doing it live again, which is quite wonderful. Yeah. So Sean and I have uh, started touring again. We went to uh, my hometown, Chicago, and then we went to Orlando with Joe Leslie Frumkin, who lives out there, and my wife Joanna Perrin, who's a great, uh, great coach, both in fiction and nonfiction. And so we did a wonderful thing, and now. Um, Sean and I will be doing a uh, New York City workshop, which is nice because I live here and don't have to stay in a hotel. <laughs> we hope to be doing one in Austin, Texas right. in September. Um, I call them the Splendiferous. The Splendiferous I call for the big ones. I just call these other ones audiobook workshops. Hmm. And the retreats are different than Splendiferous because it's a group of people going somewhere else and spending X number of days together. And we started the New England retreat in 2018 or 19. I forgot one of those years of the... Um, it was certainly in the 2000s, uh, not in the 18th century. I know that. <laughs> so um, so we, we, we go to New England, went to a place called Whispering Pines in Rhode Island. And it's just like it sounds, very bucolic and rustic and wonderful and great food. And we spent three days or we spent a weekend there, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and I think Monday or something like that. Um, now we're going to Warren Center, which is near Boston in a town called Framingham. Wonderful place, just light. And we get there on a, what do we do? We get there on a uh, Sunday. So we work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We leave Thursday. Mm-hmm. Everybody stays there. It's a community where we uh, we sold out almost in two days this year. Wow. People are so desperate to go. Yeah. And we have a great, great bunch of coaches. I, I bring some back. The the, the mainstays are uh, me, Joanna Perrin, uh, Carol Monda, Sean Pratt, Paul Allen Rubin, and his wife Paula Parker. Who's a wonder, both wonderful directors. Um, I'm going to miss some people. Um, we had a... a Shannon Parks was there last year. Joel Frumkin will be there this year. 
Um, and we tried to bring a few other people in as well. And I brought in publishers from Macmillan. Um, we had Podium last year. We got Macmillan. We have uh, Penguin Random House. We have uh, Dreamscape. And I have an independent publisher, my friend Annalise Rennie of Spectrum. So that, that gives people a chance to hear the publishers, what they want yeah. from the, from you. And it gives you a chance to meet them and work with them and see you work. And it's a wonderful experience. It's a retreat. So you are away three to four or five days. And we're hoping to do a West Coast retreat in California with Scott Brick um, in late January, February of 2023, if we can do that. Yeah. So, th- I mean, it's, it's a big deal. It's become a big part of my world. Um, it just it wasn't planned. It just happened. And it just, and, and now I do, I do coaching regularly. You can, you know, a little plug for me. You can go ahead and go to johnnyheller.com, cleverly named, and uh, you can <laughs> click under coach and you can find out how to coach with me. But... So yeah, it's it's a, I quite enjoy it. I mean, it's it's been a uh, um, I learn a lot every time I coach. Hmm. And one of the benefits of coaching with groups is that everybody, pretty much depending on the size of the group, gets a chance to do a reading and work with X number of directors who have different things to say. And, and it just cha- and 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 it's kind of like I don't know if you're ever in an acting workshop or you're doing you know long day's journey tonight, and all of a sudden the scene clicks, something went right. Like, oh my God, that's what they meant. That's what <laughs> that's what Stanislavski was talking about. So suddenly you get that moment of light and and, and you you move on to the intermediate or the uh, or the uh, advanced class all of a sudden because you finally scored the scene yeah. right. Um, so there's a lot of these uh, these um, oh these 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 epiphanies and it's fun to watch and exciting and everybody learns. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. I had um, Anne Marie Lewis on the show. Um, a couple of weeks back, and she mentioned on the show uh, that she attended your uh, the one in Chicago, I believe, mm-hmm. um, and she just couldn't say enough good things about it. Um, it was yeah, it was, I was very very envious. <laughs> well, co- yeah, you, there, there's airplanes. Although Sean and I think we'll be in the UK. You know Anna Clement, yeah, yeah, I do yeah, she's been on the show, yeah, yeah. yeah so I think we're going to be in the UK. Um, I probably next, probably not this year, but probably next year. Yeah. Um, I, I've been to London twice already to teach, and I think we're going to go. I forgot what Sean said. Is Reading sound right? Reading, yeah, just out, yeah, yeah, just yeah, near just, London, just yeah. outside of London. Yeah, he mm. said it's a little less expensive than some of the spaces, and because you know, you, part of setting the stuff up, I mean, hotels, everything's you know because I know it's the, 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 the COVID and everything. But yeah. good lord, everything's three times more expensive than it was when I last traveled. Yeah, yeah, the hotels, the food. I'm thinking mm. I, all this has to do with chips. <laughs> I'm not eating any chips, you know. So I, it's it's I, it's everything costs more, and that's I don't want to raise my prices astronomically to cover because I don't. It's it's hard. People don't have a lot of money. I don't want yeah. to take all their money. I want to. I want them to be better. I want them to feel that they've raised their game and they've set the bar higher. And how much do you do? You char- I want to give that to you. Yeah. As best I can, you know. So if people want to come to my events and they don't have money, they send me a note and I work something out. I just I don't. I'm doing fine financially as an actor, so I'm not gonna, yeah, beat up an actor from. I mean, yeah. good lord, we've all we've all been through. As you study acting, we've all been through that poverty phase, you know, mm-hmm. the our bohemian phase that people think is so exotic and wonderful, and all it is is being fucking hungry for a long time, literally hungry. Yeah. So it's not as much fun as people think. I think it's this sort of that artistic glamour, isn't there? A show and oh. portrayed, which is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm not dressed this way out of choice. I have no clothes. It's, like, <laughs> it's only glamorous if you know that by the end of the movie they'll be billionaires. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, yeah. If you if you come over, um, I would, absolutely, I'll be your first your first customer there. And where do you live? I live um, just outside of uh, Leeds in the UK. So it, it, like sort of, I'm going to say Northern England, but it's actually more sort of North middle. Um, yeah, my, my mother's family is from London and, and Kent. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah I've been to, uh, well, it's um, for us, for us at the sort of Northern uh, England, it's more, it's, it's cheaper and more accessible to go abroad than it is to travel down to London at this point. Really? Uh, yeah. Well, it's just the expense. I mean, there's a few, you can say it'll cost about if you want to go down i went down a few weeks ago um to the capital to see a show and spent the night in a hotel and it cost me 200 pounds which is like 270 dollars for the train and a crappy you know two-star hotel so it's wow. pretty it's pretty yeah yeah you know, it gets yeah it's, yeah everything is everything's more it's just more yeah. it's um 
Anyway, that's depressing. But uh... <laughs> yeah, here, here, here we are bitching about the economy. Two old guys. Oh, you sons of bitches. When I was a boy, a nickel went. <laughs> an oldie book duration can be um, often quite a, a, a solitary experience, especially when working from home studios and only coordinating through email or at best Zoom. Um, this may have been sort of touched upon in the last answer, but does gathering in that in that physical space with the community invigor your passion for the industry? Does it keep things interesting? You know, that sort of thing. And yes, absolutely. Um, it's it's uh, sharing the. Um, you know, first off, everybody involved in audiobooks, in acting in general, but audiobooks specifically, mm. um, generally has a, a real love of literature, of language, of ideas. Of, of emotions, of sharing the, uh, every aspect of the human condition. And when you're with other people, creative, creative people are just amazing to be with. Now, not all of them, because there are some people you wouldn't willingly share an elevator with, but you'll go see their films. Yeah. Uh, but by and large, it's a real sweet, and it's interesting to me how many of them have to share so many emotions and so many weird things like, you know, romance or erotica and things have to share all these. Like, I don't, erotica is the only thing I don't do. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable saying half that stuff. I'm yeah. just not. Never was. So that's fine. But some, some of these people are such introverts, and yet, yeah, you know, they talk about you know blood and gorge, love rockets and stuff, and they're in their <laughs> and their erotica stuff, which I'm like, oh my goodness. And you yeah. wouldn't, no one, you wouldn't think of it to meet them, but to see them. I mean, when, when you're home, when you're doing things just in the booth, like here's you, we're looking at each other. I, those who are listening can't see us, but we can see each other. <laughs> And that makes this conversation easier. Mm -hmm. It just does. Um, and I, I think that all the Zooms, I mean, it was, all, it was wonderful. Zoom was wonderful. And the ability that we could actually have conversations with family and friends and group lessons and coaching via Zoom, all wonderful. Mm -hmm. But nothing beats seeing someone in person. Yeah. And particularly in a group atmosphere, when you do these uh, workshops I do and the retreats, just to share, just to spend time, not just not just working on the script and trying to raise the bar of your acting or discussing uh, better ways to, uh, to get hired or what to do at marketing, anything. Just sharing a meal, sharing a drink, mm. sitting in front of the fire. There's a, uh, it, it's, it's, you, you develop friendships that last a lifetime and you develop an appreciation um, and a real love for, for these people. Yeah, for some people, real hate, but basically one or the other. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's so it's wonderful. Yeah, so I think that it's the audiobook actor is a um, it's an individual task. You know, you're by yourself in a booth, even if you're in a studio with a director and engineer, it's still you and the author sharing the story to an unseen audience, mm -hmm. and that's a bit that that takes a bit of um, know how and and uh, creativity on your part just to play it. Hmm. It's an unreal situation, you know, to share yeah. all these stories and be all these people, fiction or nonfiction, to, to share with a, an unseen audience. I don't know if, if, if the joke is landing. I don't know if the point has made it home. I don't know. Hmm. And the assumption is it has. And, and, uh, and, and so you have to give, you're, you're a wee bit blind. You don't see the audience. So, yeah, getting a chance to work with people is really, really super important and fun. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just from doing this podcast alone myself, um, in my experience of, of reaching out, it given me it's, it's given me the sort of opportunity to reach out to people, and you know, the excuse to reach out to people and chat and and say, you know, and join clubhouse meetings and all that sort of stuff. Um, and even since doing that, you know, for the last couple of months, um, well, you I've you've got to find you've got to find a list of names to who even wants to be on your show, who you want on your show, and will they come on your show? Yeah. You've got to get past who the hell is John York, you know? <laughs> it's a question I get asked quite a lot. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's been great being, you know, sort of exposed into, that, into the community more um, through, through having this and, and um, sort of, yeah, I've been invited to a few uh, these clubhouse meetings some great ones with Neil Gardner and, and Morrison Ellis and such. Yes, um, I've, I've been on one of theirs too. Yeah, they're yeah. lovely. It's, a, it's so, it was, because that was a whole new world to me, but, you know, discovering Clubhouse and things. And suddenly, hang on a second, there's, you know, thousands of people are in these groups. Um, and it just, yeah, it was, it was really nice, especially after COVID. Um, oh, yeah. To be, yeah. Cl know. I thought Clubhouse was wonderful. I, I didn't, I'm not using it as much as I probably should. For a while, mm. I did some, uh, live readings of my stuff and people just come in and listen and stuff. Mm. And I kind of I liked it. It was interesting. 
and I've been I've been in some of the rooms like Anna's room and and Morrison's mm-hmm. room, and it, it's 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 people really like it, and I think it's yeah. wonderful, and it's just a wonderful great way to connect, and you don't have to see anybody, yeah. <laughs> which is nice because some people don't want to do the Zoom. Yeah. They just, you know, I don't want to be seen, they say, you know, so they can sit in their underwear in their hot booth and talk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's 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 been a, a quite a, a revelation to me. Um I think you mentioned as well about um about uh, not feeling comfortable doing erotica and, and but yet some you can meet someone who's really introverted and then suddenly they, you know, they're unexpectedly um yeah, you know, perfect. sort of shine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they unexpectedly, you know, sort of um project this sort of confidence when in the booth. And I guess that's the thing with all kind of performance. And I was wondering if you sort of feel the same is do you sort of you know, if you're if you're on stage at a comedy club, if you're you know, at the theatre, if you're behind the mic narrating, do you sort of is it maybe even subconsciously it sort of gives you that excuse to forget yourself and, and, and just totally take on whatever the, take on the different persona. I, I think every actor, introverted or extroverted, at heart wants to be somebody else, mm-hmm. to play somebody else, or to really inhabit somebody else's... Because we always think, well, how could they think this way? And all of a sudden, you know, I mean, there's... In, 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 in these audiobooks, particularly in fiction, you get to play so many different characters and, and inhabit... I mean... I don't know what your acting background is, but you know, I'm Stanislavski trained. Um, and so there's, for lack of a different, they call it roadmaps. Let's say you're doing um, Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. I'm playing Willie. The roadmap I write is his whole life, everything. I want to know everything about him. Well, the, 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 the main character you're doing in a fiction book, you might do some kind of road mapping, but you can't road map the other 52 characters. Yeah. And yet they have to be alive to you. And I find that fascinating. And I tend to, I mean, there are, there are methods I use to make them real to me and hopefully real to the listener. Mm-hmm. But I think that, uh, that yeah, it, it's, um, you are aware that you're playing a role, but hopefully once you start, I, th- there's no point in my performance that I need to be aware I'm doing a performance. Mm-hmm. I don't want the audience, after I say, you know, this is, a, I just did Razzmatazz, a wonderful book by Christopher Moore, you know, narrated by Johnny Heller. I don't want them to think about Johnny Heller even for a second until the book's over and I say, thank you, you've been listening to Johnny Heller. That's it. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to think at all because that's not who I am anymore. Yeah, I'm whoever the author asked me to be and I think there's some wonderful anonymity in the audiobook world that you can play a thousand different... Everything I've ever wanted to be, I can be. I can play King Lear mm-hmm. in an audiobook. I, I, I can play Hamlet and I can't play both those guys right now. You know, my age and my no, I'm just not right. I'm too young for Lear and too old for Hamlet. But an audiobook, I'm not. Yeah. And I think there's something uh, wonderful about that. And I think the actor needs to uh, really, really, really get into every role and every person as much as they can. Yeah. And I think they really quite like it once they do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the biggest, um, the sort of most consistent answer I asked, um, I asked quite a few um, narrators or what is it about audiobooks specifically that draw you in as a performer and the most consistent uh, answer I had from that is I get to play all the parts yeah 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 (laughs) and I like that a lot and it certainly resonated (laughs) with me (laughs) I want to be everybody yeah (laughs) exactly and it's so yeah it's definitely one of the uh, the best bits about it Um, I always like to when sort of the you know the episodes coming to an end I like to sort of end on this question um with you know over a thousand titles to your name awards you know respect from the industry and all the rest of it do you have any advice for narrators who are up and coming to help them leave the best impression possible when working with studios and, and production companies uh, yeah, a couple of things I'll, I'll leave with first off I, I i really appreciate bringing up the awards and stuff that's all swell and i'm, I'm again honored to receive them uh, mm-hmm. the golden voice award from that's one of the that's a great, it's just an honor. Mm-hmm. And everything's an honor to get. None of us, none of us should be in this business of acting in hopes of awards. Mm-hmm. This is a business you do because you have to. Doing anything else will somehow diminish you. Mm-hmm. I think that when you deal with other people in the industry, understand what their job is. I say to my students, be an answer to their problems, not another problem. If John York Publishing um, 
wants to hire Johnny Helder to do a sci-fi book. And I say, yes, I'm going to do it. I don't think John wants that York and his casting people want to think about me again until they, till the books do. So don't, you know, so in other words, so, and understand that when you're reaching out to a publisher, to a potential, uh, someone who can hire you, get you a job, their job is, their job's like yours. They want to, they want someone to do a good job. Th- their job is to cast your job to perform. Mm-hmm. It works out fine. If they like you and they may well like you, it doesn't mean they have a job for you right that afternoon. Mm-hmm. Like you and I have never met, but I but I think you're lovely. You're quite like you. So, <laughs> next time I see if I if I'm in uh, um, uh, Leeds, I'm gonna look up John, you know. And we we I'd say, but I may not be in Leeds for a year. Yeah. And yeah. people have to realize that the actor's time frame, which is immediate, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now, isn't the publisher's time frame. If it coalesces and you're right there, I mean, there are a million things to discuss: your website, your marketing, your demos, everything. But by and large, you want to be the answer to the publisher's problems, whatever they may be. Mm. Present the so be professional, and also how would you uh, like to be um, dealt with if the if the roles were reversed? Put yourself in their shoes. Now, how would you talk to them? Like when you reach out to someone to hire you, they know why you're reaching out. So just be just be brief. Say something clever. Make make yourself sound different somehow than every other jamoke out there, and 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 be memorable, but be memorable for being good and interesting and creative, not for being a dick. <laughs> yeah. Because that you know that first impression you get to make that once, and I always tell people you know if you're an asshole you know you know you're an asshole, so don't play that card. Hold off on the asshole thing. They'll find out later, but by then they've already hired you and it's too late. Hmm. <laughs> great advice. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> Once again, another gravestone marker site. Yeah, <laughs> this guy was an asshole. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's so important, and uh, and, and should uh, everyone should be aware of that. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, we just have time for one more question, uh, if that's okay. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, to finish us off, uh, you mentioned some of the workshops and things that's coming up. Is there any upcoming projects, anything approaching in the diary, audiobook-wise, or anything that you're excited about, perhaps a, you know, a project we can look forward to? I, here's the, there's, a, there's a couple things. I'll, I'll be really quick. Yeah. I just did Razzmatazz by Christopher Moore. It's very funny. It's the sequel to Noir, and it's very funny, and I'm quite pleased. It's out from Harper. Um, it's, 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 it's funny, and I'm really, really proud of what I've done. I'm proud of what I did in the two books. They're just, uh, they carry on the characters again. And um, I, I've got these books. I got a book from uh, Tantor Audio called The Wrong Carlos. And I'll, I'll leave it with this. And it's about it, the problems with uh, um, the death penalty in America. And this guy, Carlos Hernandez, was killed for a crime he didn't commit. Mm. And the other Carlos lived right near him and looked like him. And everybody knew who he was and knew he did it. And it just, this, 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 it's, a, it's a horrible book, a wonderful book, but horrible. Yeah. And it's, it's like, what? And, and, it's, and it's a true story, nonfiction. And I just was given another book that's coming out from Find a Way, and I don't know who the actual publisher is. Uh, anyway, it's called Duped. And it's about how interrogators are trained to dupe um, um, suspects into uh, confession, confessing right. to things, whether yeah. they did it or not. They make them believe they did it. Now, I'm not anti police at all, I'm not. But I am anti railroading someone. Of course. And so I'm becoming apparently this audiobook authority on, on these bad practices, but I wasn't aware of all this stuff. Yeah. And it's really opened my eyes to this horrible thing in our society, as though there weren't enough horrible things in our society. So those are coming up. Um, I'm this, I've just, I've been working, I've probably done more books in this first half of the year than I've done in any full year so far. Wow, I've been yeah. just slamming. So, um, so there's a bunch of books coming out, but it, you know, I'm. And if anybody has any questions they want to ask, I'm serious about this. You can always email me. I'm very easy to find. Um, I've made it clear I'm easy to find. Uh, JohnnyHeller.com. My my email's there. It's it's Mr. John, Mr. No period. Mr. Johnny Heller at Gmail. It, it can't get easier. So uh, I'm happy to help people out or give advice. Just be conscious that I have time too and I have to work. But I believe this is a uh, the audiobook. The audiobook world has been wonderful to me. And I'm anxious, happy, and delighted to give back. There's always going to be work for everyone, so it's not like I'm worried. Um, and and I just I just think that the uh, like an opportunity like this is just wonderful. This would not have happened to me ten years ago. 
you know, and so it just, it's just, the, um, it's, 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 I get sentimental and I get emotional about it because it's, it's such a great way to share art and literature and stories. And so many people start learning how to read and all that. It's just a wonderful thing. And I'm waxing poetic. I'll stop. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I agree completely. And I think, I think that's really generous of you as well. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a lovely way to, to end the, uh, this episode. All of the um, relevant links to social media accounts, uh, websites and all sorts, uh, and everything else will be uh, linked in the show notes below. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've really, really enjoyed chatting to you. And I, you. It's been lovely. Thanks. Thank you. I'll visit you in Leeds. <laughs>